Okay, I think we can get started. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm I'm Zoltan Egi. I'm organizing this uh, webinar on grid interactive buildings. This doubles as a guest lecture in my class on grid interactive and occupant centric buildings. We're very very happy and fortunate to have Dr. Hill today from Southern Company. Um, Dr. Hill is an engineer, principal research engineer with the Southern Company's Energy End Use R&D organization. His research focuses on developing, implementing new technologies that enable grid interactive buildings, along with developing valuation models for them. And he's been involved with the Southern Company's Smart Neighborhood in, uh, Initiative since their conception, and he's also the technical lead for Georgia Power Smart Neighborhood since 2012. Um, he holds... BS and MS degrees in mechanical engineering from University of Alabama, and also PhD in interdisciplinary engineering, also from the University of Alabama. Uh, and also he's a licensed professional engineer in Alabama. So with that, uh, Justin, welcome. Thank oh, you. one question for you. Do you want questions at the end or during breaks or how about you prefer? I'm good either way. Probably as we go is good. Just interrupt okay. me if I don't see it and we'll just hey. stop and talk about it. Perfect. So if you have questions, uh, feel free to just start yelling into the box. <laughs> into the box. All right, take it away. All right, yeah, thank you for having me. And I think uh, just, I guess I'm the first one to kick off this series, but wanted to just point out that there's a lot of great speakers on the agenda on down the line. So just, I'm gonna try to cover what grid interactive buildings mean from an electric utility perspective and why they matter to us and why it matters for the grid. But there's a lot of other speakers that have a lot of expertise in this area and a lot of knowledge that can be shared and really point out the what works, what doesn't work, and the gaps of what the, the researchers are trying to, to figure out to make this something that's uh, both effective for the utility grid, but also all of our customers and homeowners and building operators and getting us to a the net zero carbon world. So with that i can figure out how to go to the next slide there we go so this is background on me zoltan did a good job of introducing my, going through my bio but mechanical engineer by training or by schooling and then have switched over to more of the control side around how buildings interact with the grid and taking a building all the way from the start of there is a building, how do you get that building connected? How do you get the devices in there connected back to the cloud, to the internet, to ultimately the grid? And then once you get it connected to the grid, what do you do with it? And then kind of on the far end, learning about and trying to figure out better ways to value how important that is from a monetary value. And then also from like CO2 emissions and everything everything along those lines. So looking at it from, from all the, the perspective of residential and commercial buildings. So I've been in this role since 2012 and started my career a year earlier at Southern Nuclear. So Vogel three and four, the, the nuclear plant. So almost coming online fully in Georgia. And so thought it would be a good idea to start with who Southern Company is, what we are and for those that are not familiar, Southern Company is electric utility, electric and gas utility. As of about 2016, we purchased a gas company. So the more traditional Southern Company is, you can see on the left here, highlighted in yellowish color of Alabama Power, Georgia Power, and Mississippi Power. And so pretty much all of Georgia, lower two-thirds of the state of Alabama, and then the little bottom corner in Mississippi. So that's the electric footprint I mentioned before we purchased a gas company in about 2016, I believe. And so we have expanded from just electric only and now have gas utilities in Georgia, Virginia, and our largest one is NICOR gas and outside of Chicago. So all of that combined is about 9 million customers. It's roughly split half and half. So about four and a half million electric customers, four and a half million in natural gas. And I think the, the biggest other points to take away here is about 28, 30,000 employees, 43, 44,000 megawatts of electric generation. And then we're scattered across the whole US as 
different affiliates or different parts of the company at Southern Power, Southern, um, so at Power Secure, all the, the different types of uh, energy portions of our business that are not as well known as the, the three regulated electric utilities spread out across the country. So all of my talk is really around the electric utilities, Alabama Power, Georgia Power, and Mississippi Power, and almost all of the work that I do is for the electric side of the business. So looking at how you know, we take these and implement things that are happening in California, things that are happening in Hawaii, things that are happening in Europe and uh, across the world and make that fit into the regulated business model that we have in the Southeast and make those technologies applicable to what we are doing here. So Southern Company is much like pretty much every other utility in the U.S. and has came out publicly stating our net zero carbon, net zero greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals by 2050. So we are, I guess this is 2024. In 2022, we had reduced our CO2 emissions by roughly half based on the 2007 as the baseline. And we are on track to get to 2050. Uh, but our main point is here that Southern Company does have uh, CO2 emissions goals and we're, we're working towards how do you get there by 2050. And so going back to 2022, how we've reduced the, the CO2 emissions by roughly half since 20, 2007, you can see here, most of our generation in 2022 was natural gas. So the biggest shift in how we reduced CO2 emissions was really just switching from coal to gas. So when I first started with the company, it was heavily coal-based generation, 60 to 70% probably somewhere in that ballpark range. And you can see mostly because cheap natural gas prices and the economics that came along with it, right, the transition from coal and phasing that out into more of natural gas. And then we're trying to figure out the next steps to get to the 2030 goals and then ultimately the 2050 goals. But this is where we stand as of 2022. So then I wanted to just quickly talk through basics of how Southern Company or the grid works in general. And I guess backing up a step, I have thrown out the terms Alabama Power, Georgia Power, Mississippi Power a lot. But the so they are three independent companies that work in each independent state. But as a generation system, Southern Company is our own balancing authority and we operate that. Now, what that basically means is we're in charge of managing the flows in and out of our region. So even unis and co-ops and smaller utilities are within our balancing authority and we, we manage the generation flow within that. And so for Southern Company, we dispatch everything as a fleet. So a unit in Mississippi can be turned on to serve our demand that's happening in Atlanta or vice versa. You could have the, the Vogel three or four are the nuclear units in Georgia coming online to help meet the demand that's happening in Mississippi or Alabama. So taking that into consideration, this is just a illustrative example of how that kind of happens and giving a little bit of background leading up to why buildings and gaps are important. So the one on the left is just a really a mock-up of the total Southern Company Balancing Authority region load shape for a typical summer day. So I just made a shape that looks like it gets hot in the afternoon at around 3 p.m. And so our generation is heavily air conditioner driven in the summer. So as it gets hotter outside, people's air conditioners turn on more and the demand on the system keeps rising. So with that in mind, how do you meet that? It's the most cost effective generation sources. So it really just starts it's kind of a simple, when you take a step back and think about it, it's pretty simple of how things get stacked up and you just start with the lowest cost generation and work your way up. And that's a heavily oversimplified version of how this works. But in general, the basic idea is that you start with your lowest cost option, you run that at full speed and then you stack on things until you get up to the demand. So in this, a made up example, nuclear is the cheapest asset. It doesn't turn on and off very 
quickly or easily. So you just let it run continuously at a 100% output all day during the day. So that's the yellow line here. The next on top of that, you have solar and wind. We're purchasing wind from the Midwest. We have solar generation in South Georgia, and all over our territory. But looking, our, you take what you can get from those assets and EPAs and purchasing and all those different types of things come in. So that's the next on the stack. Then the next one on top of that being uh, combined cycle plants, combined cycle natural gas plants as the next cheapest asset. So dispatch as much of that as you can. And then coal on the top, just rounding out, meeting the, and that meets the full demand in the morning and late in the afternoon. But during those highest demand times, kicking on purchases from Duke Energy is next to us or Entergy or the other utilities. If there's a market out there, so if they have excess generation that they can sell to us, we'll go out and buy it and put that into our generation mix. And then lastly, a peaker plant comes online to hit that short window. So this is just a an example of how things work and, and how we as an industry typically meet the, the, the demand by the generation side. But as I mentioned, that's an oversimplified version of how it actually works. And so if you take one baby step, I guess, into how the complexities are actually happening. So one step closer to how it really works is zooming in on that smoothed out demand curve. So that is not really a smooth curve throughout the day. It's going to fluctuate up and down depending on, and it's all consumer driven demand. So uh, industrial plants turn online, they start up a process that moves things up and if a lot of residential air conditioners come on then it moves things up and down. And so the general idea being that it's, it's all demand driven. There's no real control from the utility side. We are just taking what is seen on the grid and moving generation to meet those demands. So if it's a smooth, if it were, a smooth curve, the, the last slide would make sense where you just have a, a nice clean stack of generation that, that fits perfectly and you do that throughout the day. Closer to reality is that when it fluctuates, you hold back our traditional generation to being the natural gas combined cycle plants. Uh, we do a lot of hydro that gets held back to kind of go up and down following that more real-time demand. And Looking down at the tables at the bottom part of the, the slide, it gets put into different buckets of reserves, but every six seconds, these generators are receiving a signal of what the demand, if it needs to create more demand or less de or more generation or less generation, and it continuously responds up and down based on those signals. And so beyond six seconds, there are things that, so planning or making sure it, in the event a, say a nuclear plant trips offline to have reserves that are in or have generation that's in reserves that can respond quickly to, to ramp up and make up for that generation that's lost. So that's where it comes in with having assets that can respond in five minutes or 10 minutes or 90 minutes or within two hours to meet those different time frames and ride through uh, any type of issue or event that happens unexpectedly on the grid. Um, so I guess I, I meant to also say the when you're holding back those generation assets, the example being instead of running a combined cycle plan at 100% output or I guess whatever its theoretical highest efficiency is, those units are throttled back to just, for example, 50% output. So it can ramp quickly up or it can ramp down in generation and it has that ability to, to load follow what's going on. So last point here, I talked a lot about Southern Company because that's where I work, but it, the grid functions the same throughout the country. And the, the blue table on the left is how we define it. The, the table or the screenshot from the right was a, took a screenshot from ERCOT's publicly available website and it just went up. They have different names, reg up, reg down, spinning, non-spinning reserves. They're all doing the same type of thing. And there are, hours are a little bit more closed off, but there are public data sets and 
different markets where you can go in and see what those are actually doing in real time and historically. Justin, there is a question in the chat. Um, this Southern okay. company run market in any of these grid services? No, we do everything internal. So I think that was the question. Mm -hmm. There is not an open market like a PJM or um, Kaiso or even ERCOT. So there's not a an ISO or RTO, those types of markets. Everything is done in-house. And so we are doing it all. We're doing it all. It's just not open to have uh, outside organizations bid in those resources. Cool. Thank you. See, I think there was another one, but I'll continue on. It's oh, okay. Let's see. Yeah, I'll stop and just rely on you to interrupt me with questions that come into the chat. I'll do yeah. that. Thank you. So, so that was a kind of a background of how things work today. And so this slide pointing out the future where there's more renewables. So all of this culminating up into, we had those 2050 net zero carbon goals. And to get there, there's gonna be a lot of different things that have to happen, but the most obvious and basic are more renewable generation coming online. So more solar and more wind and more more assets similar to that. So that leads to less dispatchable generation. Uh, there's a little caveat there that we're also looking at, can you make solar dispatchable and hold that resource back instead of generation? But that we can kind of ignore that for now and just picture solar is coming online, wind is coming online, and those resources are only available when they're available. They're not, you can't just force the sun to shine or the wind to blow type thing. And and so those are coming online. They also bring with them imperfect forecasting of you don't know short term what the generation is going to be from solar and much less longer term. The, the further you get out, there's more uncertainty in how all these assets start stacking up to, to meet the demand and how all those things fit together. So ultimately, there's more uncertainty on the supply side where traditionally the grid operator pushes a button and turns on a natural gas generator and they are very confident 50 megawatts or 100 megawatts or whatever the megawatt they need comes out the other end where that that part starts to go away with more and more renewables and so with that also comes the need for increasing the amount of reserves that we talked about on the last slide and those become from you know, I don't know the number, a couple of percent of your total generation for any given time to double that or triple that. And, and then al also, I feel like it's not a good utility presentation on this type of um, topic if you don't throw out the duck curve. So the duck curve, I'm gonna just assume everybody's familiar with it, everybody has heard about it and moving from the duck curve into now EPRI is trying to coin the canyon of this the climb out of the solar over generating during the day when the solar starts fading offline that's when people start getting home and the demand climbs as the solar reduces so having needing additional services to come on and so in in addition to the services i talked about before now needing other things to happen to where you can meet that steep ramp and when maybe a, a natural gas plant or other battery resources out there are locked down for whatever reason you need to be able to react quickly and go you know, high capacity in short periods of time so creating new services on top of that so bottom line on this slide is with more renewables we all know it makes the uh, the grid even more difficult to to maintain balance and operate. Right. See, so this is a high level slide on how Southern Company's research and development team we are looking at meeting those net zero carbon goals, and it really spans you know, all the way back from 
forgot to mention before, but we are a vertically integrated utility, which means we do everything from buying the natural gas to burning the natural gas to generate electricity to transmitting it over transmission lines and distribution system, and then down all the way to selling it to the customer. So that means we are the full stack of what an electric utility does. And so we have research teams that are dedicated to each bucket of what we do as a business. And so these are just some examples of what our R&D team is focused on and trying to get new technologies to, to meet the needs to get hit net zero carbon. So specifically for today, looking at the highlighted ones here of how buildings, energy storage, and distributed energy resources, specifically those on customer sites. Our term is behind the meter, but what that really means is it's customer-owned assets or customer sited assets where a battery or a solar or a thermostat or a water heater or whatever it is is within their premise and has a touch back to us and can can change its operation based on a signal and how that can ultimately lead back into improve grid reliability and grid flexibility to so grid reliability and grid flexibility to address the things that we talked about earlier of how the generation all piles together to, to meet demand and how all those reserve buckets make things more complicated. How can you then, instead of just accepting what energy demand is on a customer side, so whether it's a industrial process or a commercial building, a commercial high rise in Atlanta or a house in South Alabama, how do those things, how can the utility and the building talk to one another and coordinate to where you can, get all that you need on the services that you use electricity for on one end and better optimize how the grid works on the other end. There is a small question in the in the chat on, do you have off-peak rates for your customers, residential customers at this time? Yes. The short answer is yes. They're, the more complex answer is Alabama Power has a set of rates, Georgia Power has a set of rates, Mississippi Power has a set of rates. All of them, at least Alabama Power and Georgia Power have time of use rates and time of use rates with demand component on top of it. Mississippi Power is working on it. The last I heard they were talking about it. I don't know enough to say that they have it or do not have it yet. But the, so that's a short term fix and just thinking through the type of flexibility that's needed longer term so short term, you just want to move from the peak events that happen and early in the morning in the winter time or late in the afternoon on summer. And if you can send a static signal to say shift off of that, then that works today. You know, you're offsetting. You're not having to turn on those peaker plants. You're not having to purchase from other utilities at extremely high prices. So it works for that piece today. But as you get to a more dynamic the way generation works of the dynamics of solar and wind, those times may not always be when you want people to shift off of. So it could be sending the wrong signal. So today they work in the future, looking at how you either add that com the complexity behind a more static, just 12 cents a kilowatt hour type thing, or if it's a $200 a month bill or whatever that may be of a, of a bill that has the complexity, but adds another le level of control so you can get the the connectivity and the flexibility out of it at the same time. So hopefully that helps without confusing it too much. Thank you. <clears throat> so I've been talking about load flexibility and GEBS and all these different types of things. And I didn't take the time at the front to explain what I actually mean, but this is our definition. Really, it's a completely broad term and can mean pretty much anything. But my summary definition is if there is a device or a building that can connect to the grid, receive a signal for the from the grid, respond to it, and do so in a way that is not or that benefits the grid themselves and then also society. So the grid 
benefiting themselves with lower bills, benefiting the grid by having better flexibility. So to improve the operational side and then societal benefit of helping us meet those net zero carbon goals and get the grid cleaner and shorter term utilize the solar resources or the, the renewable resources that are available and then longer term be able to provide that flexibility that can, can move things around so the grid can operate more effectively. Yeah. Another question came up, maybe you come to this a little later. Do you have rates with APIs to allow device manufacturers to receive and act on energy price signals? For the the time of use rates are just static. So there's a, a rate sheet or a tariff sheet that you can go download from to get those. In the large commercial industrial space, Georgia Power specifically, Alabama Power has a, a small program, but they have real-time pricing, which is a little bit of a misnomer, but it is hour ahead for, so let me back up. They have two different real-time pricing rates, which are increments of one hour. The first one is day ahead. So at like four or 5 PM one day, they'll send an email with the breakdown of hourly pricing for the next day. And, and, it will also forecast what the prices are supposed to be for the next seven days, I believe. So you get a 24 hour of fixed prices and this is what your prices are going to be per hour for the next the next day. And then a forecast of what those prices will be for the, the week after. And then there's another program that if you're a larger customer, then hour ahead. So you get every hour you get sent the price for the next hour. And then also the forecast of what that price is going to be for the next 24 hours. So in a rolling increment, you get you get that information. There are some ways to get that through an API. You have to be a customer on there. So maybe um, just a point to throw out there, Southern Company isn't as open as places like ERCOD where you can go and then get the data and just download it. We are, secretive is not the right word, but we are, we hold our data closer to our chest than other utilities do. And so if you're on the rate, you can go out there and grab the data. There are APIs. I'll, I'll get to a project we did later, but that in that project, we connected to the API to pull in the rates and use that information for testing out load flexibility. And so they exist, but you have to be a customer or you have to be a consultant to that customer that gets permission and, um, checks all the legal boxes to get there. Cool. Thank you. All right. So I talked about load flexibility a lot, backing up to how load flexibility fits into all those reserves or how it fits into grid operations, uh, just in general, looking at it from purely demand response or load shedding, uh, this is the the type of thing that's been around since before I was born. So in the, the 1980s, utilities were doing this type of thing. And we've had programs for, I guess that makes it 40 years now, of having industrial processes that you sign up for an interruptible rate, is what we call it. And you sign up for it, you get a discount, and we get to use your capacity that you will shed into our planning process. And ultimately, you... I guess for the last 40 years, somebody picks up a phone, calls that industrial site and says, tomorrow we're going to have a critical event. We need you to shed and call your interruptible rate or interruptible load. And that is a very manual process. It's completely intrusive. Nobody likes it. We do not like to call it. Customers do not like it when we call it, but it is there for those say emergency situations or when there aren't enough generation assets to meet demand. We have those on the books that we can call. A similar one is residential air conditioner load cycling or residential load shedding. So where on the hottest days of the summer or the coldest days of the winter, when the demand is outpacing generation, we can push a button, send a signal, and it turns off your air conditioner for for the event. I think it actually cycles it so it runs has some out some control that says you ran for 30 minutes the last hour so we'll let you run for 15 minutes this hour 
but it, it greatly reduces the amount of time your air conditioner can run for that event, whether it's one hour or four hours, something like that. So there's all these programs that are legacy programs. We do a lot with thermosets and it's really just the same thing that's been done for the last 40 years. It's just connected over a Wi-Fi thermostat now, instead of having a low control switch be installed by a technician that comes to your house. So it connects over the Wi-Fi, but it, it increases the temperature set point in your house. It gives a little bit of flexibility, but ultimately it's just making you uncomfortable, whether it's in the winter or the summer in the benefit of the grid long-term. So this is, I mentioned before, not well liked, I guess the opposite of occupant centric controls. It is grid centric controls. So only in emergencies, only for grid benefit. And you get cut a check at the end for participating. Um, nobody likes it. And it's kind of tapped out. I mentioned several times it's been around for 40 years. So there's not a lot of new signups and it's kind of capped out on what is available, but it is worth the most in all of these different buckets because capacity is the most expensive way to, or the most expensive thing that takes to operate the grid. So if you can offset building a new generation asset by having these on, on the books and being able to call it, then that is the most valuable piece. So how do you do that in a way where you can get the grid benefit and you can get that capacity value without just making everybody hate the program that's on it and likely opt out after a couple of, ev of events happen. So this is a mix of capacity and um, more traditional, what I think of with low flexibility of if you can send a day ahead signal or a signal to a device or a building, can you take smarter controls and shift when things happen. So you're always keeping occupant comfort at the forefront of the controls, but you're looking at it from a time varying price or time varying signal that's marginal CO2 emissions or that uh, grid reserve signal, whatever the signal is, can you take that signal, do some smart controls with it and you throw out all the buzzwords of AI, machine learning, reinforcement learning, model predictive controls, whatever they may be, can you use that type of uh, control to input this, import the signal and then get a result on the out, output of it to where the, the air conditioner runs at the right time, the water heater runs at the right time, the batteries charge and discharge at the right times. So you're, you're doing all of these things that the grid needs, but doing it without impacting customers and occupants and building occupants when they're at work. So no, not everyone is getting hot or cold for these events to happen. And that one, the traditional way to think about it is fuel savings and going back to all the way back to how the generation gets stacked up. If you can, if that price of that, of the marginal generation that happens is a dollar fifty a kilowatt hour. If you can shift from a dollar fifty a kilowatt hour purchase to ten cents a kilowatt hour purchase, there's massive amounts of dollar savings that can be had, and fuel savings on our end too. So we don't have to buy that expensive generation. We can use this type of control instead. But daily, those prices don't vary as much. So the looking at how, and that's why the um, the piece of the pie here is a little bit smaller, but looking at arbitrage really. And then getting into the reserves that we talked about before of how do you take and forecast out what your usage is and know what's available both to increase your usage and decrease your usage ultimately anytime during the day and consistently updating that and rolling it back so it can be incorporated into your reserve bucket and the grid operators know if I need this, this is what I can call. And how does that get the value get passed on to the, the building, the building owners, building occupants, customers, whatever you want to call that. And the biggest gap here is frequency regulation. So that six second interval response is pretty well understood. The other buckets are not. And so nobody, there are markets out there for so like PJM and Kaiso and those markets have pricing signals that go out there or they go out into the market and acquire services at that price. 
for us, it's all built into a natural gas generator. So it's not really well understood what value you can assign to a building to provide this resource. So that's one thing that we're working on, just trying to figure that out. But it's, as you can see here, the, the slice of the pie in terms of value is pretty small, but it's only for frequency. So if you can start adding in those other services, we're trying to figure out if that the piece of the pie or it makes the pie bigger in overall value. Justin, there's another question uh, okay. on the pricing. Uh, in, in the real-time pricing schemes available today that you mentioned, can consumers, and I assume this <clears throat> means residential, expect to receive periods of higher, both higher and lower prices over the day, or do you have any protections also built into that? For residential, there are no real-time price, so it's only for large commercial. I want to say... I just heard the number yesterday, I think, and don't quote me on it, it's 400 kW peak load or above can get on the day ahead. And then mm -hmm. you have to be in the, the megawatts of demand before you can get on the hour ahead. And so there, there are no protections. It's the way it works is there's a baseline load. So you're, that is not variable. There is a fixed rate that you pay for your baseline load throughout the year. And then there is a segment of that commercial industrial demand that is, I guess, uh, what's the word? It's you pay the real-time pricing rate for that amount. So it's not the full amount, but it's a portion on top. And that is subject to the real-time price. And if you, if prices are $4 or $5 a kilowatt hour, you can, you just pay the four or five K dollars a kilowatt hour for any usage above your baseline. But if you see that price and you respond and you actually go underneath your baseline load demand, then Georgia Power will pay you for that extra energies at the marginal cost rate. So you could either, so maybe that's a protection if you're willing to respond to the pricing signal that you can, if you use more, you pay, if you use less than your baseline, excuse me, you actually get paid back from Georgia Power at the marginal cost rate. So they pay you for not consuming that at four or $5 a kilowatt hour instead of you paying four or $5 kil dollars a kilowatt hour. But that's only in large commercial industrial mm -hmm. space. Do you know there was another question following this one? <laughs> Sorry, the, the, <laughs> do you know the the relative percentage or, or no, the percentage of commercial industrial compared to residential energy use within your users? <clears throat> energy use is pretty easy. It's about a third, a third, and a third, roughly mm -hmm. speaking. The commercial is about a third. Residential use is about a third of the energy, and industrial is about a third. Mm -hmm. Customer numbers, I don't know right off. And those numbers are also changing. So as you can imagine, in 2018 timeframe, everybody drove to the office and to residential use kind of dipped during the day. But now that people work from home, like I'm here, mm -hmm. that the residential use stays up and also commercial use stays up as mm -hmm. well because some people are going into the office and there's not a full 100% setback in energy use when there's not 100% occupancy in a, a commercial building. So those aren't exactly linear you still have to turn the, all the lights on heat up or cool down the office space and so those are shifting data centers are a big thing too so as microsoft google apple all the the big data centers are coming online we're seeing a lot of demand and a lot of energy use from that and so it's becoming almost its own segment own segment mm -hmm. on top of those so residential commercial industrial data centers of energy use that's coming on from that so there's it, i guess to actually answer the question simply a third a third a third and... right cool let's continue there's another question but let's continue with your talk and then i'll take that question later okay yeah i'll i'll hurry it up a little bit too but these are so all of those things again they sound great. There's capabilities there. The technology within buildings, there sh it shows promise, I guess is a good way of saying, as a low cost option to enable grid flexibility. So having buildings respond to the grid needs and using controls to do that without 
impacting occupant comfort or convenience or productivity or any of those types of things. So seamlessly happening in the background, the controls are doing this work for the on behalf of the building. The issue with that is it doesn't exist today and there's a lot of gaps that exist in the market or exist in the technology the market or just beyond technology that have to be addressed to, to get us there to a future where buildings can actively pay, play a role in the grid. And maybe a, a good point here is to say, I mentioned, again, we've had demand response programs for 40 years, but they are not very dynamic. They're static. They're fixed to when they can be called. And also, they're just not very big. There's not a lot of megawatts that need or that are enrolled that can make much of an impact on the grid. So I mentioned early on, generation for Southern Company is 44,000 megawatts. And so if you have... 100 water heaters at 500 watts, you're in the, the KWs and they don't care about it. So getting to megawatt scale or tens of megawatts of scale or hundreds of megawatts of flexibility that can be moved back and forth is really what's required to, to make anything meaningful for the operators to pay attention to. So getting to that type of scale, these are a list of nine of the gaps that our group has identified that are out there. There's probably more, but these are the nine most relevant for us that we've we found. The top three are technical. The other six are not really technical, but around things like data and IT and cybersecurity. Lawyers have to get involved and in how do you make money as a business? But, but I think most importantly for the non-technical side is the customer appetite. And do customers really want this? Or are they willing to participate in this? Is there enough value given back to them that they are willing to give up some control in their house and allow the grid or a control system on their behalf to manage their comfort and their temperature settings and HVAC fan speeds and water heating and the temperatures in their water heater and all these things? Are they willing, do they see enough value to actually participate and allow us to implement these types of programs. And I think that's another place where occupant centric controls are vital to making this successful. So we will never get there if we're relying on load shedding in the summer and the winter where you, you make people uncomfortable. That's never gonna scale up enough. There will never be enough people that are willing to give, give up that control for today we give $25 a year to enroll in a, a demand response program. So it's very minimal benefit or very minimal value to them for the risk of being uncomfortable for a few days a year. And then on the technical side, a lot of the things I've talked about before, just how much value is out there. How much can you do with load flexibility? Can you make a building really like a battery with these types of controls where you can use more energy when you need to, use less energy when you need to, and do all of this by keeping people comfortable and not turning off the lights or turning off the HVAC. And then more specifically, getting those devices connected to the internet or connected to the grid and having data flow, the data that you need flow back and forth and actually have that happen. So I, maybe an example of the project I'm about to talk about as 46 town homes, and we specifically went out, worked with the homeowners to turn, connect all the devices in their house, which was three thermostats, a energy meter, sub metering system, a battery inverter, a solar inverter, and uh, one other thing that I can't think of right off the top of my head. But all those, all those connected to the Wi-Fi and then connected back to our, our IT platform. And so everything, all 46 were 100% functional on day one. And on about a year into the project, 18 out of those 46 were fully functional. So just having the, you know, what's the word, having the ability to rely on that communication to actually still be there within six months or a year is you can't build a program where you lose half of your participants or more than half of your participants within a year. So that leads also into planning and operator trust. So they have to be able to trust that when they push a button or send a signal, the buildings are going to respond. 
So all that is background into the projects we are doing to try to address some of these these gaps and a lot of the issues that we talked about before. So really quickly on the Alabama Power Smart Neighborhood and the Georgia Power Smart Neighborhood, there were two initiatives that we took on to take a look into the future of what highly efficient homes, highly efficient construction, high efficiency mechanical equipment mixed with two different futures of residential solar distributed energy resources, if you will, of the Alabama power model where you have down here on the right, uh, community microgrid, community solar with a community battery with a community backup generator paired with highly efficient construction of 62 single family homes in Birmingham and having a loose connection between the heat pump water heaters and the thermostats with the microgrid and managing all those assets together that can electrically disconnect from the grid if it needs to. So if there's an outage, then the microgrid automatically detects it, switches over and powers the community indefinitely because they have a natural gas generator, but for a long time, it can operate with just a battery and the solar. So looking at it from that model versus a model in Georgia where it's 46 townhomes, highly efficient maybe, but higher efficient is a better way to say it, but focusing on individual rooftop solar, individual battery storage, and a much deeper integration of thermostats, the HVAC, water heating, uh, so another heat pump water heater, but heat pump water heater, HVAC, solar, and battery and at least being aware of the EVs and how all the, those things fit together. So this is the project where we had the signal sent to uh, the real-time pricing signal was sent out to these homes and there was controls that were developed by Oak Ridge National Labs to take that, to ingest that pricing signal and shift when thermostat set points are happening and looking at, um, yeah, thermostat set points, water heater settings, and then when to charge and when to discharge the battery at the lowest cost overall for the house. So this is an example of some results where you can see the whole neighborhood respond on the left of the pricing on the red days are when we had control. The green was the Friday before or the week before where there was no controls happening. So in the afternoon, the usage in the neighborhood continues to, to tick up later in the day you know, where even when the pricing flattens out, but as on the control day, the pricing creeps up in the afternoon, but the control is able to shift that usage. You can see here where it's shifting and remains flat throughout the high price event. And then the ones on the right are just the same thing, but individual houses of how they respond. And you can see with the, the, the HVAC, it shuts things off. The control shut thing, shut the, HVAC down a little bit, so not completely off, but it shuts it down, and then it sees that it's getting uncomfortable for the, the homeowners or the occupant. So it turns the AC back on a, for a little while here to cool the space off, and then when it gets to a certain threshold, it turns it off and rides throughout the, the high price event. So that I think the biggest takeaway we had from this overall project and this specific uh, slide of results is that homes have the capability to respond, to receive a, a varying price signal or a variable signal, whatever that is, and can flex load and move load around without impacting occupants. So maybe a quick story being that we ran this type of control the first week and we told homeowners about it. And we also were very aggressive on our settings. I think we did plus or minus two or three degrees as the floating window of what we could control and people hated it. They had my cell phone number and I had about five to 10 calls within a couple hours saying, I'm hot, how do I get out of this program? How do I turn this off and never never bother me again? So we, we took that feedback to heart and went back and redid how the controls worked and uh, continuously ran the controls like the output you see here for two years without any additional complaints from the customers. So just narrowing that band and being more intelligent about when things happen, how things happen, and also how things get communicated. There are two questions regarding okay. that is 
actually mm -hmm. three now. Okay, so, <laughs> so uh, you're hitting the spot here. So the, the first one was the clarification, the energy resources, you have price sensitive controllers in this case. That's correct, right? Correct. Okay. And then the second question, what specific grid service is the objective of the smart neighborhoods? And what is the KPI of the effectiveness? Mm -hmm. It's a really good question. I think the the biggest level takeaway or highest level takeaway is there are so you can move demand around and we were able to move demand around in this this example and throughout the project. Mm -hmm. And we're working on quantifying what that is more than or I guess beyond just one day. But the the grid services were looking at demand and then the load flexibility and being able to Yes, energy arbitrage here, but leading into if you give a control a variable signal, can they respond? And the answer that we saw was yes. Mm -hmm. We did mm -hmm. we did go down the road of those more advanced services of forecasting out and pulling it back into a system that can keep track of what uh, what the services could be on an ongoing rolling basis. Then we ran into some IT issues and our data flow stopped for the solar, the thermostat, and the battery. So there was not as much value for the last six or eight months of the project. So we, we didn't get to explore that completely, but we at least mocked up what it would look like. And and were you able to extrapolate the value in megawatts or you know saved energy or load management for a larger area from this? Or would you say it's a success in this case? We're working on that. So one of your or our future panelists is at EPRI is pulling together a, a final report to pull mm -hmm. you know, all of those types of lessons learned into one and then taking and figuring out next steps of what do we do next and how what worked, what didn't work, and how mm -hmm. can this be successful across the state of Georgia, across the Southeast, those types of questions to answer. Cool. So just a quick announcement. We are about like five, six minutes out. So maybe we'll hold questions until uh, Justin closes up. So we should yeah. finish. Thank you. I'll do I'll do these fast. Sorry, I, I got a little carried away on the beginning. But these are some of the, the key takeaways that we saw from this project and other projects where, we, where we're trying to take uh, load flexibility into account and send a signal and have have things respond. So we already talked about a lot of them, so I won't spend a lot of time, but quantifying how much flexibility exists and how much, how many dollars is that worth per KW that you can flex and how do you even quantify what a dollar is because, I mean, what a, a KW really is because it's a KW and 4 p.m. in the afternoon is a different value that you can flex than a at 9 p.m. or 1 a.m. Those are different values. So being able to quantify over the course of a year and at different scenarios, how, how valuable that actually is. And then is there enough additional value to doing this continuous optimization or these occupant centric controls? Is there enough value to the grid to justify all of the work that had to go into building out the IT platform, getting devices connected, keeping devices connected, and then the controls on the other half of that of, is it worth it? And I guess the, the next two ability to predict what really makes people comfortable. When can, how can you make everybody happy all the time? I think the, the answer is no, but how do you do our best, do the best job we can at making, you know, keeping track of the stochastic nature of people working from home, not working from home. Maybe one person is working this day and then the next day both or two people are working from home. And how do you take that into account into your controls? Forecasting day ahead pricing is more difficult than forecasting the weather because it's dependent on the weather, but then there's also other variables that, that come into play. Uh, I'll skip the next one because planning tools use average data. Not truly relevant for here, but something that we're working on. And then you're also limited by the device that you select and what capabilities the manufacturer or the thermostat or the water heater enable you to do with that in your control. So it's not always the perfect scenario if you have full control of a device. We have variable capacity heat pumps in one of the projects, but we were limited to only being able to change the, the temperature set point. And then all their proprietary controls on the back end manage the fan speed and the compressor speed and how all that worked together. 
So it, it limited the amount of flexibility that we could get out of it and similar things with water heaters and other devices. So this is a switching gears, a project that we are working on now to uh, take the learnings from the residential space and move it into a large commercial building. And we are working on that. So the Georgia Power Headquarters in Atlanta, a high rise, 22 stories or so, uh, a, a high rise in downtown Atlanta of looking, it will have, or it has rooftop solar on the parking deck. It has a building automation system. And then we are working to install a battery storage system on site and to figure out how those three assets can begin to work together on a large scale. And instead of just accepting what the solar produces, accepting what the building energy consumption is and having a static charge discharge schedule for the battery, how all of those three things can begin to communicate with each other, coordinate and work together to provide a, a more optimal or a more valuable set of grid resources together than any one individual component could do by itself. And then also looking at other things of how, how you can then take a grid asset with a battery and use it for resilience and backup power and um, efficiencies that can be gained from all of that type of thing. So this project is just starting and we are still contracting. So I can talk about conceptual ideas here, but as far as the, what we've learned so far, it's, we've learned DOE contracting. Um, back on the residential really fast. So we, we talked about the Alabama power and the Georgia power smart neighborhood but we're also working on two additional projects with Mississippi Power and NICOR Gas. Mississippi Power is looking at how do you take these from a research project and put it into a commercially viable system. So I have Tesla power walls, Tesla shingles, some controls that are commercially available. And how do you do this at scale? So how do you get from a hundred homes on these two projects to something that these operating companies can go buy off the shelf and scale out to hundreds of thousands of customers. So that's at least the intent of how to figure out how to do that. And then NICOR gas looking at how do you do affordable homes and how does natural gas fit into a net zero carbon future and how does natural gas kind of bridge the cost gap of not putting in overly expensive technologies that don't necessarily make sense today into houses that can't afford them and how does natural gas bridge that gap so all of that leads to this is our southern company load flexibility simple strategy high level getting more flexibility per device and turning it more into a battery getting more kw sites so we talked about um, the georgia power headquarters project and large commercial but we're also working with campuses of Georgia Tech is in our territory, University of Alabama is in our territory. So looking at how do you take those campuses and use them as a megawatts at a time flexibility? And then how do you get better modeling of, of these assets into, so translating from engineer speak into system planners and utility planners and generation planners and transmission planners. How do you take the work that we're doing and translate it into terms that they understand and will accept? And doing all of that while lowering the cost of the controls and the platforms that are required to, to integrate it and operationalize it. And then the last one really fast, everything I talked about so far today is around, around the generation side. So it doesn't matter if the generation or this house is located in Mobile, Alabama or Savannah, Georgia or Gulfport, Mississippi, it's all the same. But there's a, a future where it does matter and the distribution feeder that this building sits behind, you can need to shed load on one feeder and use more energy on the feeder next to it. And so getting these platforms into a derm solution where you can have locational value of these as well is also in our roadmap and our plans. So that's everything for me. All righty. Awesome. Thank you, Justin. Right on time. <laughs> so we're right on time. If, if there is one pressing question, maybe now is a good time uh, to answer or to ask. There's a lot of thank you clapping. Thank you. In that case, I will thank you um, for this awesome insights.
Absolutely. And, uh, Thanks for having me. There's some congratulations. I'll leave that. Maybe this is a great uh, final word. Is it impressive what you have achieved? Congratulations. Being in contact with uh, European this, so I can imagine that technical detail is a small part of this enormous project. So I'll let everybody slide in there. Congratulations. Very impressive uh, work. Uh, it's a great kickoff to the webinar series. Like you said, every coming at the very end to close. Uh, with, with Siva's presentation. So hopefully that will maybe even cross an arc. And uh, with that, thank you. Oh, one question I have for a practical reason. Can I share these slides with our viewers, listeners, or or, or a public version of it, if you have one? Yes, let me make double sure on a couple of slides, but I don't think there's a problem. Very good. So we'll do that. We'll be in touch. All right, I'll stop recording.